It's the magic of the musicals. It's Alex Belfield with you, talking to the big stars of Broadway today, and <laughs> one of my favourite people. No, no, don't put yourself down, Fred Applegate. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Good now, who's stalking you. who here? Because it started in New York mm-hmm. when you were playing Max Bialystok, and then that happened in London, and then I saw you in Vegas, and now we're here again. Yeah, well, I guess it would pretty much have to be you then, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing? Because you're in this brand new show called Young Frankenstein, which Indeed. was a worry for me. It was a concern because there was a lot to live up to, wasn't there? Well, yes, expectations are high. Well, there's really nothing to worry about. It's a Mel Brooks musical. I mean, the worst <laughs> thing that can happen is it'll be funny. Um, the expectations are very high for this project, and uh, I think we've come through. People are very happy. And you've done it again. You get the first big laugh, don't you? I do. I do. Lucky me. <laughs> well, that's because I have the first big line, and every line pretty much gets a laugh. So, But thanks for thinking of me. Absolutely. Now, I saw you on a matinee today. How does that vary from an evening show? Well, it was interesting. This matinee was really quite delightful because it's a holiday matinee here and you know after thanksgiving and people are out shopping and they're just happy to get off their feet for a little while <laughs> um, but uh, these uh, matinees and the evening shows there's been no difference people are very excited i suppose we could say you're one of mel brooks's boys now he kind of trusts you doesn't he <laughs> well being called a boy is something that hasn't happened in quite a while but yes yeah he does trust me uh they called me and asked me to do the reading of this and then called me and just asked me to do it which was very nice for those who don't know, tell the story of Young Frankenstein. It's a bit silly, really, isn't it? Well, it is. It's based on the movie, this 1973 movie, uh, that Frankenstein's grandson inherits the castle and has to go back. And uh, much against his better judgment, he's sort of seduced into creating his own monster. And hilarity ensues. How does this character compare with Max Bialystok? Uh, this is an easy ride compared to Max. But actually, Roger uh, Bart, who plays Dr. Frankenstein, is on stage a greater percentage of the show than Max is on stage in the producers. He's actually off stage less than Max was. So I, I, my hat's off to him because he's a much younger man. He kind of gets the 11 o'clock number right at the beginning, which I thought was odd and remarkable. And I hope the audience appreciated it as much as I did because it was pretty tricky, wasn't it? Well, we appreciated it. Like two days after they wrote the number, he came in and did that patter section because this, this uh, it's, it's, it's a Gilbert and Sullivan patter song essentially at the beginning of our show and he just knocks it off like it's nothing and it's it really starts the show with a bang can we talk about the comparisons between being on broadway and in the west end oh it, it's much the same as new york um the the really fantastic things are really fantastic and then you know, it's variable after that uh the level of talent in terms of the talent pool um Well, you know, we're a country of 350 million, and New York is a city of, you know, a metropolitan area of almost 80 million, and everyone's drawn to New York, much like London. So the talent pool is pretty much the same. Tell me about your daily routine in getting into character, because you do two roles in the show. Mm -hmm. Uh, As far as getting into character, since I'm doing two roles, I find if I just don't bother, it's better. Um, (laughs) (laughs) That way I'm not confused. Uh, I look at my sleeve, I think, oh, I'm I'm Kemp, and uh, then I I speak. Um, (laughs) People, it's, it's strange how many people don't know I do both roles and at the curtain call as you saw I have a trick costume I come out as Inspector Kemp and then within the space of about two seconds I'm completely the hermit with the white beard and the robe and everything and I can hear the audience gasp because they didn't realize I had done both parts I just I find that delightful I find it a little hard to believe frankly but um yeah, I find that very satisfying. I suppose there's a certain expectation now with people. When you go and see the producers, then to come to this, you know you're going to have to have a big show to compete with it. Mm-hmm. Yes, a huge show. And we do. It, it is spectacularly huge. And they didn't, they didn't, nothing stopped them because there's one scene where the monster's being created. In the movie, there's lightning. And they thought, well, can we have lightning? And our set designer, Robin Wagner, said, well, you can have lightning if you want. And they said, well, yeah, let's have lightning. So we have lightning on stage. <laughs> and you look at it and you think, my, that's actually lightning. And that's not a small thing to accomplish. And they just, it was that way with everything. Can we do this? Well, sure. And they just did it. Do you think he just spends his entire life writing stuff down to stick him in a musical at some point? Well, it certainly seems that way, but uh, he's just so creative. Everything comes out, and he'll, he'll stuff it into the format it needs to be. But I really think with the musicals, he, his thinking is almost unlimited, even more than a film. Because in a film, you have certain strictures of style and budget and timing and planning and all this stuff. And in a musical, he can think, can we have lightning? Can we have a a forest go by? Can they actually go through a forest? Can we do it with a projection? And someone will say, sure, figure it out. (laughs) 
he kind of has his certain style of gags, his almost Jewish humour where you kind of see it coming, that vaudeville shtick stuff, which he loves in the producers. There's kind of a bit less of it in this because I think there's more music. Am I right in saying that? Yes, there is more music, and it's a completely different style. It's much more in the style of an operetta, um, because the, the show takes place in 1934, and he went back and wrote music, and uh, Glenn Kelly and Doug Besterman uh, arranged and orchestrated it much more in the style of, uh, of Frimmel and Romberg. And in rehearsals, we were constantly hearing from Mel about Romberg and Frimmel and <laughs> operettas and all these, all these references and people and composers and writers and all these things. His encyclopedic knowledge of musical theater is really quite remarkable. He's too smart for me because I feel I'm missing too much. Do you know what I mean? I watch it and I think, well, I'm getting that gag, but what gags am I missing? Yeah, and it's it's a lot like that when you talk to him as well. <laughs> like, I think I understand what you mean, but clearly you mean something else as well. Um, well, it, and it, it, it does. It rewards seeing it again. It, uh, I did the producers for, for three or four months before I realized one of my favorite lyrics was in the background of a chorus that just slipped right by. Um, the, one of the lyrics was the toast of society's burning tonight and you know it just it's it's a lyric about burning toast and he yeah just really smart he's really smart he seems to have no fear either he takes risks with some of his jokes there's not much bad language in it but there's interesting things if you read into it yes well he's the king of the double entendre leaning more toward the entendre than the double part um <laughs> yes he but it, it's almost like um there's a precociousness to it that makes it okay. He, he can get away with it because it's it's just meant to tickle you. It's just to keep you, you know, it's it's like his shows grab you and they just start gently tickling you and then all they have to do every now and then is poke you and it keeps you going. I mean, I never thought I'd see the knockers gag in a musical ever. <laughs> You know, I was actually in, uh, when I was in London, we went over to Paris, and my, my daughter and my wife at the Louvre, which is what those knockers are based on, is the, the great doors on the on the carriage entrance of the Louvre, they stood there and had me take a picture, and we have it labeled, nice knockers. I just, <laughs> it's iconic. How are you finding the two show days? I mean, this has always fascinated me about you, that you can seemingly get through it with absolute ease. I've sat here now having done one show with another one looming. You don't seem at all depressed. No. Well, no, Mel Brooks doesn't depress you. Uh, when they close, it depresses you. Um, no, we're, I'm great. I'm excited to be doing this. And it's kind of something you train for. You know, I'm, it's like... Uh, uh, this is what you do shows. This is where we actually have a nice schedule because we do two on Wednesday and two on Saturday and Sunday at three. A lot of shows do Friday, two Saturday and two Sunday, which is essentially five shows in 50 hours. And by the end of that schedule, you are dead no matter who you are. Uh, but this show, this schedule is pretty good. When you have those five show weekends, are there moments when you don't know whether you're in the middle of the first one or at the end of the second one or maybe at the beginning of the last one? Uh, there are times when you question your choice of career <laughs> way beyond that. <laughs> yes, you do. Uh, have we done this? Did we, have I done that? Sh I I thought we sang that, didn't we? Oh, we did. That was later. Okay. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And let's finally talk about this theatre, because it seems very nice compared to some of the dumps I've been in in the West End and Broadway recently. <laughs> well, the West End has a pass because some of the theatres are a couple hundred years old. Um, this theatre is only 12 years old, and when they remodeled it, they did a beautiful job. I don't know if you saw the lobby with the mosaic on the floor and the gold leaf and the ceiling. And uh, for somebody building a theatre 12 years ago, that was very ambitious. They pumped a lot of money into making it a beautiful environment for the audience. And uh, that was nice. It's not an empty box that everything's focused on the stage that they did the wall panels and they did a beautiful carpet and i'm really really delighted to be in here and backstage is so modern it's big and it's everything works uh, it's really a pleasure fred tell me what it was like being in the producers the movie big hit around the world do ladies want to rip your clothes off now whenever they see you really don't know what to say to that <laughs> The next time I see a lady, I'll, I'll bring it up. Yeah, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, oh, yes. You see, well, that, Mel, that's something Mel would write. Freddie, it's always nice to talk to you. And I'll tell you why, because you're one of those personality people that you kind of steal the stage and you know what you're doing. There aren't that many of them around. It seems like they're all brilliant on Broadway and in the West End, but not many stick out. And this show certainly utilizes a lot of great talent. Roger Bard is unbelievable. Yeah. And again, he seems to really care about that. Mel really wants people that are unique. He does. Um, he also wants people to sort of get his humor and it, I have seen people not get it um, and so he, I don't know I guess he wants people who have loved his movies since they, <laughs> they came out and I saw 
Young Frankenstein when it first came out and was just absolutely doubled over, and I'm just thrilled to be a part of this. There was a lady sat next to me today who really, I felt like punching by the end of it because I was wanting to say to her, that's a great gag, you just missed it. <laughs> well, you know. That's okay, too. That's why there's 1,800 people out there. Anyway, I didn't punch her and I didn't get arrested, so that was a relief. That's a comfort. Fred Applegate, thank you very much for talking to me again. Ah, it's always a pleasure. Where do you think we'll meet next? Oh, God. <laughs> I'll try to hide from you somewhere. I think South America next.